one of the scriptures that comes to mind. It's where the friends um, lower their other friend down through the roof to be in front of Jesus. That's really been what's happened with our community, our church community here is everyone's been holding the ropes for us. Um, whether that was praying or uh, offering support financially to us or just encouragement. We have never felt alone hmm. so through this. We've been a part of LifeGate. We came July 11th, six years ago. We had the opportunity to meet with the worship pastor and uh, both of us got the opportunity to audition together. She was able to sing, I was able to play. We've always been big on serving wherever we go. It's just like we're, we're not church sitters, you know, where we just sit in the seat. We uh, like to get involved. My mom is actually a breast cancer survivor. And because of that, I was, it was recommended to me to begin mammograms, early screening mammograms um, before the age of 40. And I had one routine mammogram and it was perfectly normal, which was encouraging. Um, and then COVID happened and I think I missed one and then followed up uh, in 22. And that's when I discovered that I actually had a mass. She came home and I could already see, you know, she's ready, you know, had been crying or was crying and I knew where she was coming from. And I'm like, oh boy, I think we just hugged and just <laughs> yeah, cried there on a driveway. It's, it's hard, it's hard the treatment, the things surrounding it, the, the inability to do certain things, it's, it's challenging. And I'm a worshiper, I'm a worshiper at heart. And I refused, I refused and I refused to allow the enemy to take that away from me because that is how I serve my God, that is how I show him my gratitude. That is how I really um, demonstrate the strength that he's given me in my worship. And I, I had committed to myself that I would not let it go. I would not let it go. My mom and I were in the car. I was talking to her about some some additional like services that I would want to get. And then I was like, well, it's probably not going to be covered by insurance, so it's going to be extra money. And so I don't know, We I probably won't do that. And my mom immediately said, the Lord will provide. And like within seconds, my phone rang and it was, you know, the church kind of giving us the news that we would be recipients of the, uh, the Love Gives First offering. And it was amazing. Like that, that was an immediate, immediate answer to prayer. Currently, I just completed my final chemotherapy. So I had six of them and I'm done. Thank you, Jesus. Um, so right now I will have about four weeks um, before my surgery and I'll be doing a bilateral mastectomy and then from that I will be recovering and then beginning radiation therapy after that. I've been meditating on the scripture, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And that's Psalm 91. The Holy Spirit has been showing and revealing to me that I'm in his shadow, going through something challenging like cancer. That dark place might and is, I believe that it is his shadow because he is just that close. Anyone feeling like they are lost and alone, remember that you are in his shadow. He's there defending you and protecting you. And it's one thing to say that, and believe that, but it's another thing to really experience that. That has been the most rewarding thing from this journey. And it might sound weird to say, but I, I wouldn't trade that. 
I wouldn't trade that to have a complete clean bill of health. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. It is awesome that we can do this together. And man, after a video like that, I just want to say you are an amazing church. That's just one of many stories of how your generosity, your prayers, and your care are impacting the lives of some of the most desperate people in our body and in our community. You guys are amazing. God is faithful, and you need to know that Sharana had her mastectomy on Thursday and is at home recovering and is doing great. So can we give the Lord a hand for that? Well, my name is Micah. I am the lead pastor here at LifeGate. And if that is new information to you, that's because it's a new change. As of two weeks ago, Pastor Les handed me the mantle of leadership after 27 years of him faithfully leading us and passionately leading us. We've been in a three-year transition process that culminated a couple weeks back and just want y'all to know, to be ultra clear, that we are not losing Pastor Les. He is not retiring. He is still among us. He's going to be serving and ministering in different capacities. You're still going to be hearing him preach from time to time. And so he and his wife, Chris, are with us this morning. Can y'all give them a hand? What an amazing couple. This has been really an amazing process. I'm so grateful that we could be a part of it. And I want to also say this, it's awesome that we can do this across many locations. And if you're joining us this Easter morning from one of our other Omaha area locations, or maybe you're in Serbia, or maybe you're just joining us online and you just got done doing a little Easter egg hunt or something like that, we are so glad that you are with us. Now, I want to start this time together by giving you an opportunity to get in touch with what Easter means to you. Just think about that for a second. What does Easter mean to you? What are the thoughts, the memories, the feelings that come to your mind when you think about Easter? I know for me, growing up in the South, Easter was always the beginning of the warm, beautiful weather. It was almost always a beautiful, warm day. And one of my first Easter's here, it was snowing. And I just had to like recover from that for a little bit. It was, it was a little tough. And, and so for me, it's warm weather. It's deviled eggs. My mom would make these little deviled eggs like once a year. And it was like wearing my brother's old nice clothes. And he was like tall and thin. And I'm clearly not. And so it was, it was like rolled up sleeves and pants and, you know, kind of doing my best to smile for the pictures. And and I remember this, that, that I knew the words, right? Like I knew that when someone said on Easter morning, he's risen, you say he's risen indeed. But it wasn't until a little bit later in life that I actually began to understand the significance of that little statement. There's a lot of y'all in this room or in any of the rooms that we're a part of and it, that, that might say, I know the language, right? I know what to say, he is risen indeed. But if you're really honest, you might say, on the daily, like, I'm not really sure it has much of an impact on my life. Like, yeah, it's going to have an eternal impact on my life, but what about here and now in this moment? I want to, during our time, talk about what Jesus's biggest miracle means for our everyday, what his best day means for our hardest days, and what his highest moment means for our lowest moments. Ultimately, what Easter is, is it's an invitation to come home. It's an invitation 
to the world from the Father to come home and to be a part of the family and to be a part of the house that he has created us to be a part of. We're going to read a homecoming story that occurred just after Jesus' resurrection that I believe many of us will relate to as we read through this. John chapter 21 is where we're going to be in Scripture. You can turn there, click there, or there will be a big Bible on the screen behind me in just a minute. John 21 is just after Jesus has been resurrected, and he's introduced himself, he's revealed himself to a few disciples, to Thomas and some others, and, and this seems to be his first encounter with his, one of his closest disciples named Peter. Peter and some others had gone out fishing one night as they're just kind of wondering how to put their lives back together after the rabbi who they sold their lives for has now been arrested and crucified, and they have a terrible night fishing, and Jesus shows up on the shore of the Sea of Galilee while they're still still out in the water. And he says, throw your nets to the other side of the boat. And so they throw their nets onto the right side of the boat and they have a miraculous catch of fish. And in that moment, John, who's on the boat, knows it's the Lord, it's Jesus. And Peter, who had been fishing naked, puts on his clothes and he dives into the water and goes after it. We say naked in the South, sorry. That's the way we talk. It doesn't feel genuine to say naked. I'm sorry. I've I tried for years, and now I've just gone back to my roots, okay? And here's where we're picking it up. John chapter 21, verse 15. And when they had finished eating, Jesus had just served them breakfast. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And there, a lot of commentators are, are curious, like, do you mean, like, was he asking Peter, do you love me more than all this fishing gear and the fishing life? Or do you love me more than you love these brothers and sisters in Christ that you're kind of hanging out with or the the ones who are following me? I actually believe it was D.A. Carson who says this, that what Jesus was really getting at, and we know this because of how Peter was wired, is, Peter, do you really think you love me more than the rest of them love me? It's kind of a competition thing with Peter, and you're going to see this. This is always what was really at the core of his heart. And he responds, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were young, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Now, if you don't know the background of their relationship, This might feel like one of those conversations you've had with that kind of needy, insecure friend. Like, they come to you and they're like, hey, are we okay? And you're like, yes, we're okay. Like, are you sure we're okay? And you're like, I'm sure we're okay. And Like, are you really sure we're okay? And if you're like me, you respond, we were okay. But you are driving me crazy now. We are no longer okay, right? You've all been in that place before. That's not at all what was happening here. When you understand the background of these two and and their history and their relationship, this conversation makes a lot more sense. See, just a few days earlier, right before Jesus was arrested, he was preparing his disciples for what was to come. And he was letting them know, like, some of you are going to be tempted to lose heart and you're going to get discouraged and you're going to get afraid when everything goes down like it's about to go down. And Peter was the first to step up and say, God, I will never betray you. I will never run from you. In fact, I will die for, for you. And Jesus says to him, actually, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows, before tomorrow morning. And as we follow the story, what we discover, Jesus is arrested. Peter distances himself from Jesus, watches from a distance as people come up to him and ask him, aren't you one of the disciples? Aren't you from Galilee? I think I saw you with this man. And all three times, 
He says, never. What are you talking about? I've never even met this man. And the most piercing version of this is in Luke chapter 22. Just after the third denial, it says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Jesus and Peter caught eyes after that last moment of betrayal across the courtyard. And then Peter remembered the words the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Immediately after his final denial, Peter was struck by his own unfaithfulness. This was especially difficult for Peter because of the group of disciples. We have to know this, that if you look at the group of, group of disciples, there's going to be ones in the group that we connect with and we like, and there's going to be ones in the group that we don't like so much. There were quite a variety of young men who were following Jesus, and, and among them, Peter would have been like the bro of the group. He would have been like the alpha male, or kind of the new term right now is the giga chad. I don't know if you're Gen Z, you know what a giga chad is. You can look it up. So a chad is like a basic dad, and a giga chad is like an ultra basic dad, okay? So you can look that up. It's like, it's like the alpha male in the group. I'm learning all kinds of things from my kids, right? And uh, it's the alpha male of the group. It's the one who had to be the best, who had to be the, the, the most, who had to be the first, the first to speak, the first to act the first to kind of elbow his way to the front and say, I'll be the one to go. This is how Peter had consistently postured himself among the other disciples. And then he's the one who not just one time or two times, but three times completely denies any relationship with Jesus. I got to believe this was Peter's lowest moment, his lowest moment, because he, in that moment, got in touch with the true core of where he was and what he would be in just his own strength and in his own efforts. I don't know if you're at a point in your life where you've had your lowest moment yet. Maybe some of you are in this room and you're at your lowest moment. The addiction feels too strong. The marriage is unraveling. The doubts feel like they're winning the day. The fears are overwhelming. The anxiety is crippling. The habits of hurt and pain towards others just won't stop. Peter knows what it's like to be in your lowest moment. And I believe we get a glimpse into his here in this story. And so then you fast forward to this conversation with he and Jesus, and all of a sudden it begins to make sense. Three times Jesus asks him, do you love me? To cover over these three denials that Jesus, that Peter had declared. Three opportunities that Jesus gives Peter, not for Jesus, but for Peter to declare and to stand on his commitment to Jesus, his faith in Jesus, his loyalty and his willingness to go wherever he called him to go. See, when Jesus died, he offers us forgiveness of sins. When he rises, he offers us a restored life. And this is the kind of conversation that was going on here, is that this was a post-resurrection conversation about restoration. This is a post-resurrection conversation about restoration. We know this, that Jesus forgiving us of our sins is just the beginning, it's just the threshold it's just the doorway to enter into all that God has for us. And the type of conversation that was happening here between Peter and Jesus was Jesus helping Peter see, I'm coming to you in your lowest moment where you're tempted to go back to the way things have always been and instead I'm calling you home. Isn't it interesting that after Peter fails, he goes back to fishing. Because isn't that what we often do in our lowest moments? I guess God can't fix me. I'm not even sure he wants anything to do with me. I'm just going to do what I've always known to do for myself and hope that works out okay. And yet Jesus stands on the shore and he calls to Peter. He invites him to breakfast and then he asks him these questions. Do you love me? 
Like ultimately, that's what this whole thing is about is do you love me? Not are you going to try to impress me? Not are you going to be better than everybody else? But just me and you, do you love me? And he comes to us in our lowest moments and asks the very same question. I died for your sin, but I, ra- I was raised for your restoration. Do you want to do this together with me? Do you want to move forward with me? Do we want to go somewhere together? Ultimately, what Jesus was asking Peter was the same thing that he had asked him earlier in their friendship. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Like, like where do we stand? I know Jesus would say, where I stand with you, you're forgiven. The question is, where do you stand with me? Who do you say I am? And that question is true for every single one of us. It doesn't matter who grandma says Jesus is. It doesn't matter who I say Jesus is. It doesn't matter what the church says Jesus is. At the end of the day, what matters most for your restoration and your wholeness and your destiny and you walking in everything that Jesus has for you, like he did for Peter, is who do you say Jesus is? Let me tell you three things that the scripture tells us about who Jesus is. And then we're going to have an opportunity to respond to this. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. The resurrection of Jesus is the hinge point for everything we believe. It's the hinge point for everything we believe. You can't give your heart fully to Jesus if you don't know and believe that he is risen indeed. At the same time, if you actually know and believe that he has risen indeed, it should change everything about how you live life from that point forward. It's the hinge point for our entire faith. It tells us three big things about who Jesus is. The first is the resurrection tells us that Jesus is God, that Jesus is God. He's the only man to predict his death and his resurrection and then pull it off. Other people have predicted their deaths. Other people have predicted the resurrections, but no one's ever done it, and he has. And the fact that he has should catch our attention. Even for the one who is the most skeptical among us, who's like, I think it's a good story, I think it has good principles, but I don't know that it actually happened. Just think about this. 2,000 years ago, placed in a tomb, covered by a huge stone, guarded by Roman soldiers, Then he showed himself to 500 people, it says in 1 Corinthians 15. If those 500 were making something up, all the Romans had to do was roll the stone away and say, there's the body of Jesus. Or if it was a conspiracy theory, all the Romans had to do was uncover the conspiracy theory. They could do that. We've heard stories of grave robbers, y'all, but grave robbers don't rob graves that have stones in front of them guarded by two Roman guards three days later. You might rob a grave three months later, but not three days later. There's too much security around it. N.T. Wright says this, it's not on the burden of the church to prove that the resurrection happened. It's actually on the burden of the unbelievers to prove that it didn't happen. And in 2,000 years, no one has been able to come up with a better believable story of what could have happened other than the fact that the Son of God rose from the dead. And there is no body, and there is no conspiracy. And if that is true, then everything that Jesus ever said means more than anything anybody else has ever said. If it's true that Jesus rose again, then everything he has to say means more than anything else anyone else has ever said. The resurrection tells us Jesus is God. The second, the resurrection tells us that Jesus cares, that he cares. Romans 5.10, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall, shall we be saved through his life? We are reconciled to God. We are forgiven through his death. We are given new life through his resurrected life. See, The Christian faith is the only worldview, philosophy, religion, or story, if you want to call it that, that actually deals with the human condition with both honesty and compassion. 
Honesty and compassion. Here's what I mean by that. There's a lot of worldviews that don't deal with the human condition honestly. They try to deny the fact that we are sinful beings. They try to convince everybody we're all okay, we're not that bad. It's pretty easy for people who live in affluent Western countries to say the world's not that bad. It's really difficult for people who live in places like Syria or Israel or Iran or China to say the world's not that bad. People who are suffering on a daily basis would never believe that lie that people are basically good. We are sinful beings. We rebel against the ways of God and we hurt one another. It's just what we do. And the Bible is not afraid to tell us that, that we have all fallen short of God's standard. But what scripture goes on to say, but I have a compassionate solution for how to walk through that. And no other religion offers a compassionate solution. Hinduism says we're imperfect and so you need to sacrifice in order to be saved. Islam says we're imperfect, you need to obey in order to be saved and discipline yourself in order to be saved. Buddhism says we're imperfect, you need to meditate your way into salvation and then hope for the best. What Christianity says is you're a sinful being and you need to surrender in order to be saved. You just have to let go. You have to release control. And you believe and receive that what Jesus did on the cross and on this day 2,000 years ago actually happened and that it does matter. That he made a way through our sin. That he took the punishment that we deserve so that we don't have to experience it. And that he went to death for us so that we never have to die. And that's the last thing that the resurrection tells us. The resurrection tells us there's hope. 1 Corinthians 15 again. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Y'all, if we truly believe he is risen indeed, we have nothing to fear. We have only hope because he has put death to death. He has destroyed death. And at the end of the day, if we don't fear death, then we have nothing at all to fear. That we have new life awaiting us. That it says in scripture that because Jesus rose from the dead, we will rise from the dead again too. And so here's what happens. When we put our faith in Jesus, if we die before he returns, our spirit is going to go to this place we know is heaven. And our body's going to go into the ground. But that's not where things stay forever, the Bible tells us. There will come a day when Jesus brings everybody from heaven back to earth and will be reunited into a glorified body and will get to experience the best that this world has to offer and none of the bad stuff that we had to endure. I like to think of it like maybe every day will be like yesterday, 72 and sunny. Like, I was thinking this morning, like, Lord, if there's going to be snow, because as far as I know, the sun will still be at it, where it is, and the earth will still be shaped like it is. If there's going to be snow, can you at least make it to where it's never more than three inches, and it's never on roads and sidewalks? Like, that'd be, that would be paradise, right? For those of you that love it, you get to look at it, but those of us that hate it don't have to deal with it. Like, that, this would be no sorrow, no pain, only joy and bliss. You think about those who would be in relationship with you. No more offense, no more abuse, no more misuse. Like the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, it says, is a first fruits. It's evidence that we'll get the same thing too. And we can have hope even in our worst days, even in our hardest moments, that this is not the way it's always going to be. And then even in our best moments, we realize that's just a taste of the eternal that is to come. What the resurrection tells us is that Jesus is God. There is no other. That he cares, that he's motivated by love for us, and that in him there is hope. And together, these three things offer us an invitation to come home to the Father's house is the poet T.S. Eliot who, ba- who said, life is basically one long homecoming. 
We were created by God. We drifted through sin. And there is a constant invitation from God to come back home to the one who created us. Come back home to the one who knows us. Come back home to the one who loves us. And most of what we're experiencing in our lives is an attempt to experience what we will find in the Father's house, but we're doing it on our own terms. We're like Peter, who once Jesus was crucified, arrested and crucified, said, I guess I'm just going to go back to fishing. And so many of us have done that. I guess I'm just going to do self-help. I guess I'm just going to get better. I guess I'm going to try harder. I guess I'll just pray more. I guess I'll go to church more often. But Jesus says, no, just believe and receive that my death and my resurrection happened and they matter. St. Augustine said it this way, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So much of what we experience on a daily basis is our attempts to find our home. And Easter is the great declaration, you can come home to me. To the skeptic, the resurrection tells us that Jesus is the reliable way to the Father's house. To the guilt-ridden, the resurrection tells us that Jesus is the source of the Father's forgiveness, grace, and mercy. And to the fear-filled, the resurrection tells us that Jesus is our hope for life with the Father. And so what we're going to do is give y'all this opportunity as we close out at all of our campuses just to kind of have a sacred moment, have a holy moment before you run off to all the things that you need to do and, and reflect on this question, who do I say Jesus is? At the end of the day, not just he is risen indeed, but in my heart of hearts, in the depth of who I am, who do I actually say that Jesus is? Do I really see him as Savior, as Lord? Do I see God as a loving Father who's inviting me home? Are there things in my life that I need to lay at his feet in order to have relationship with him? What do I need to surrender? What do I need to let go of? And what do I need to let him minister to and restore like he did Peter? And ultimately, all Jesus needs to hear to do his great work in our lives is, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I choose you. Jesus, I want relationship with you. I choose to love you. I choose to follow you. I choose to be yours. Forgive me of my sin. That little conversation restores in us all the things that God wants to pour into our lives. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to sing a song together and just let the words wash over our hearts and let the Holy Spirit work in our spirits. Lord, we love you. We thank you that you sent your son to deal with our sin. We thank you that in you there's nothing but grace. There's nothing but mercy. There's nothing but acceptance and peace. And so, Holy Spirit, I'm just asking that you'd move right now. I'm asking, Jesus, that you would have your way among us. Speak to our hearts as we look to the resurrection as we look to the sacrifice, as we look to the new life that we have in you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.